Morning, everyone. Morning. Uh, so I'm Katie Miller, uh, also sometimes known as Code Miller, and I'm from Red Hat. Uh, today, I'm going to be touching on three different areas. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, geospatial applications or apps that make use of data that has a geographical component. Uh, a little bit about cloud computing, or more specifically, platform as a service, and a little bit on uh, auto scaling of applications. And I'll bring all those three things together in a demo app. Uh, so the demo app is going to be auto scaling. Uh, it's going to be a simple mapping app, and it's going to be hosted in the cloud, uh, with the aim of uh, getting all of you guys up to speed to the point where you could go out and make an app like this for yourself. Uh, and if you are keen to do that, I'm actually going to be doing a workshop session this afternoon. So if you come along to that, we can actually step through uh, in detail exactly how to get something like what I'm going to be showing you up and running for yourself. So uh, a couple of caveats. This isn't going to be a deep dive into geospatial analysis. It's just really the basics, just scratching the surface um, enough to kind of get you started. Uh, and I'm probably not going to have a lot of time for questions in this session. So if you do have questions, uh, come along to the workshop or catch me around the conference. I have a whole bag of swag. Uh, I've got a bunch of these books and t-shirts like the one I'm wearing. So come and find me uh, to get some swag from the swag bag later on. Um, before we go any further, though, I want to find out a little bit about you guys. Um, so you can get some idea of what languages that you like to code in. Who codes in Python? Can get a show of hands, anyone? Uh, a few? OK, PHP? Yeah, a few more hands. Uh, Java, a few, um, Perl, a few, oh, okay. Uh, and what else have I missed? Ruby, <laughs> enthusiastic hands for that. Uh, and something else that I've missed, <laughs> you didn't get to raise a hand. What do you like to code in? C. C, okay, cool. Um, and who uh, uses MongoDB? Forgot any MongoDB users. Okay, a smattering. All right, so the demo app today that I'm using, it's actually written in Python, but that's not gonna be uh, too important for the purposes of what I'm going to show you, so it doesn't matter even if you don't understand Python. Uh, it's also going to be using Mongo. So for those who aren't familiar with Mongo, we're getting uh, to see a little bit of that. Uh, one final question. Who would say they could define the term platform as a service? Anyone feel confident that? Okay, a couple, but most not. Um, so by the end of this session, probably everyone should feel that you could probably do that or make some attempt to, you've got a reasonable understanding of what that's actually all about. So in order to make a mapping app, you need some data to map. So I went out to try and find uh, an exciting data set for Australia. I was hoping, you know, for like most dangerous places or biggest tourist statues or drop air distribution or something. Uh, I ended up with public toilets, uh, which is a little bit more pedestrian, but still adequate for our purposes today. And still actually quite a special part of our culture if you think about it. Uh, so the demo app that I've got today is called Lufu. Here's a, a little demo. Uh, so here it is embedded. So you can move around the map. And as you go in, we've got different facilities that are mapped. And when you get down to the level of a point, you can click on one and find out a little bit more information about it. So simple app, uh, all using open components though. So this is all open source code, open data, and it's hosted on open cloud platform. So this is the kind of thing you'll be able to make for yourself by the end of this and certainly by the end of the workshop. Uh, so I mentioned I'm going to talk a little bit about auto scaling. Uh, and this is actually an auto scaling app. Uh, so in order to demonstrate that, I thought I'd actually start hitting it with some load during this presentation session, which hopefully the network is all going to work. Uh, so this is BlazeMeter. It's a little um, web-based tool for doing JMeter type testing. And I've got it set up to do an extreme stress test with 1,000 users on four different uh, endpoints on this app. So I'm going to kick that off now. And hopefully later on, we'll be able to come back and see that that app has actually been scaling uh, in response to that load. And how are we going to see that? So here's a version of the app. If I uh, put on the end HA proxy status. So it's showing us, and don't worry about everything that's going on on this page, but notice here that there's one green bar. So that means that we've got one container, or what we call gear, uh, serving up code for this application. When we come back later, hopefully we'll see that that's changed. So to start off with the spatial part, can anyone tell me what shape the Earth is? Anyone have an idea? Yes. Ellipsoid. Yes, winner, you get a book. <laughs> um, so the Earth, uh, yeah, I won't throw it at you, that would be a bit cruel. Uh, 
So the Earth is not a perfect sphere, it's an ellipsoid, and so we need to take account for that uh, when we're making our mapping applications. So there's a couple of terms that you probably want to be aware of. Let's make that full screen again. Uh, when we're doing our ooh, mapping applications. Uh, so the first one is datum. So a datum is just a model of the Earth that's used for mapping. So this is a series of numbers that define uh, the shape and size of the ellipsoid we call Earth and its uh, orientation in space. And you can have different datums for different purposes. So you can imagine one datum that might give you a really good fit for the whole of the Earth overall, or the best fit you can kind of do, might actually be a poor fit for a particular place on Earth. So you might want a different datum that's specialised for a particular area, depending on what it is uh, that you're doing. So um, longitudes and latitudes are always specified in terms of a datum. The second term we want to be aware of is projection. So we know our Earth is three-dimensional, but when we have our maps on a computer screen or a piece of paper or whatnot, they're two-dimensional. So the process of taking that three-dimensional object and flattening out is called projection. And when we do that, there are necessarily distortions because we can't perfectly represent something 3D and 2D. So we have different trade-offs that we make between, uh, with accuracy, you know, the shape of the things on the map, how accurate that is, or the distance of things between, uh, uh, between different things. And you will have seen this if you've seen different maps of the world and notice how the countries are sometimes different shapes or uh, positioned slightly differently to what you might, might have thought. So this is uh, talking about projection. So if we have a datum and a projection and a unit of distance, those things together make a coordinate reference system. Uh, long story short of all of that is if you're making a mapping app and your points are coming up somewhere different on the map to where you expect, you may well have a problem with your datum or your projection. So a little bit of uh, terminology related to the data format and the format specifically of the data that I'm using for this app. Uh, so the coordinates that are defined there on that map are defined in terms of this, WGS84, all these intimidating numbers. So this is World Geodetic System 84, and then we've got a particular standard number. So this defines a particular coordinate reference system, and that's the one that those points have been defined uh, under. So that defines a particular data and a particular projection. And it's actually quite a popular coordinate reference system. It's the one that's used for GPS. So you kind of see it around quite a bit. And when you uh, download your data, it's something that you want to check out is which uh, actual um, one of these standards that it's defined in terms of. Uh, the next thing is GeoJSON. So this is a, a standard format for encoding basic um, geographical data and, and also non-geo attributes for simple things like lines and polygon, polygons and whatnot. Um, the reason I've chosen to use this is because it's uh, supported well in MongoDB. And MongoDB also uses WGS84 by default as well. So that's the reason why I've chosen those uh, particular standards. Um, but the data that I actually got, that I downloaded for the public toilets, came as a CSV. So I needed to somehow take that CSV and turn it into GeoJSON. And to do that, I used a little command line tool called OGR to OGR. This comes from a library called GDAL, it's open source, the Geographic Data Abstraction, Geospatial Data Abstraction <laughs> Library, I believe. For me, that was like sudo yum install GDAL, uh, whatever operating system you're using, there'll be a way of getting that tool. And so that's how I was able to change one data point into it another. Where did I find the data though? Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different places where you can find data. Uh, for this particular data set, I found it on data.gov.au, so it's a government data set. There's also one for New Zealand. There's a whole bunch of other websites where you can go to find uh, great open data that you can then use for your mapping applications. So I'll talk quickly uh, about the stack that's in place uh, for this app. I'm not going to go into too much detail because this isn't a Python talk or a PHP talk or whatnot. Uh, so it is a Python app in this case, and it's using Flask, which is just a really lightweight Python micro framework, uh, a la Sinatra, that kind of style. Uh, also using Leaflet.js. So this is a really awesome client-side JavaScript library uh, that makes it really easy to get up and running making mapping apps. Uh, so it has support for things like OpenStreetMap out of the box. It works on a mobile out of the box, which is great. And it has a whole bunch of plugins. So if you saw in the demo app before how those points were kind of clustered and as you zoomed in, they, they came out. That's actually a plugin for Leaflet.js that's doing that. And the other bit of the stack that I've already mentioned a bit is MongoDB. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar with it, this is a, a schemaless document 
database. Uh, so the data is in so documents, it's collections of, of attributes and values, kind of JSON style, well that's not actually stored as JSON, it enables you to kind of nest your data down. And it's known, it's called Mongo from the word humongous, it's good at uh, running a lot of queries using replication and horizontal scaling, handling uh, data quite well. And for us, which is great, it also has some nice features that help you get started with spatial. Uh, so as of Mongo 2.4, it handles this GeoJSON format natively, which is nice. Uh, it has support for both 2D and 2D sphere indices. Uh, so the uh, app that I showed you was using a 2D sphere index. And it also has support for a number of different queries that you might want to run uh, based on the data and your indexes that you have. So things like what things are near to this thing, what things are within this particular uh, polygon and, and whatnot. And the final piece is platform as a service, which only a few of you said you knew what it meant. So let me explain what that means. Uh, so we've got a whole bunch of things here that are all cloud computing things. They're all as a service. So on the left, we've got infrastructure as a service and platform and software. And the slide has been cut uh, a little bit, so I'll just explain. So the, the blue here are things that are being managed by the provider of the service and the purple are things uh, sorry, other way around. Purple is being managed for you by the provider and the blue is things that you're managing for yourself. So when you get something like your infrastructure as a service, so quintessential example of this would be something like Amazon EC2, uh, you get a certain amount of things managed for you but you still have to choose what your operating system is going to be and you've got to keep that up to date uh, and you have to install all your languages or your middleware and that kind of thing and you know, if there's a security issue you're you know, responsible for then going and fixing all of that up. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we've got software as a service. So this is something like your web-based email, Gmail, Yahoo, or whatnot. As a developer, there's nothing there for you to manage. It just works. It's all there for you. So platform as a service, this thing I'm talking about, sits in the middle. Uh, so you can see you still have to manage something yourself, your application code and the data that operates on. But all these other things are taken care of you, taken care for you by the platform. So out of the box, things will just work. You can tweak the configuration for these things should you need to, but you kind of get uh, up and running with a stack that just works very quickly and easily. So that's kind of the aim of this. So it's to give you a flow like this as a developer. You write your code, you deploy it, it runs. That's it. Whereas you know anyone who's uh, worked in the real world will know often there are a lot of other steps that can come between these things, like racking and stacking and nagging a sysadmin for you know, the things that you need installed on a server and whatnot. There's a lot of other things that can get in the way of you just coding and then deploying that out and having it running. So why bother with platform as a service? Uh, so this is from a developer point of view. There's a different set of uh, benefits from a sysadmin point of view. But it enables you as a developer to focus on your code rather than configuring uh, those things enables you to get code out the door very fast. Uh, with a lot of parsers, it's as simple as like a git push and OpenShift is one of those. It's very convenient, easy to uh, um, get a stack up and running for whatever it is that you want. Uh, efficiency, so rather than having to host your own stuff, you know, you're obviously using, making the best use of, of your hardware there. And it's also able to do things like idling down apps that aren't hit for a while and that kind of thing to make things efficient. Scalability. So again, this is something that a platform can handle for you, and it can even be auto-scaling, as we'll see. And finally, the polyglot capabilities. Um, so you might do Ruby or Python or whatnot. You might decide one day, though, oh, what if I wanted to try Java or you know something different? Uh, so a PaaS enables you to just get up and running with a new technology without having to know anything about configuring it, because you get out of the box something that just works. So it's fun for exploring as a dev, trying different things. So oh, again, these slides, are, uh, the res is failing us, but uh, the PaaS by Red Hat is called OpenShift. But the word OpenShift is actually kind of an overloaded term. It actually means three different things. So OpenShift is an open source project, and that one's referred to as OpenShift Origin. This is on GitHub, and it's Apache 2 licensed. As currently, the current version is written in Ruby, but at the moment they're working towards OpenShift v3, which is all going to be architected around uh, Docker and Kubernetes, and that version is going to be written in Go. Uh, and that open source pro project feeds into two other projects. So we've got OpenShift Online, so this is a hosted public cloud service. If you go to openshift.com, that's what you'll get. Uh, and that's got uh, more than 2 million apps, I think, deployed on there at last count. Uh, and there's a, a free tier on there where you get three containers or gears to run apps for free that each have a gig of uh, storage and 512 meg of RAM. 
And then on the other end, if you're a big company and you want support from Red Hat to run a version of this, there's OpenShift Enterprise, and there's a number of big companies running that. So this is uh, a little look under the hood, and this is talking about OpenShift V2. So we're not looking at Docker in this picture yet. Uh, so basically, this will run anywhere that Red Hat Enterprise Linux will run. You can run it on your local machine. You can run it on OpenStack. You can run it on EC2, which is actually what OpenShift.com runs on. It can, it can run on a, wherever. And you've got uh, important pieces there. You've got the, the broker up here. So this is manages the orchestration of a number of these nodes. On each node, you have containers, which we refer to as gears. Uh, and then your apps run within those. So the containerization is done at the moment using SE Linux and C groups. Uh, but then in the future, there's going to be a Docker in this picture as well. Uh, and this picture is, is illustrating that within these containers or gears, you also have what we refer to as cartridges. So these are the different uh, technologies that you might want to plug into those. So this is demonstrating a JBoss app that has also a gear with MySQL running it. And you're always going to have things like Git and Cron and that accessible as well. And it's also showing that these uh, gears can be idled down for efficiency as well. There are a number of different ways of talking to OpenShift. So the OpenShift broker that manages that orchestration. Uh, there's some IDE plugins for Eclipse uh, and whatnot. And there's a REST API if you want to roll your own tool and uh, maybe do some crazy things with Jenkins or whatnot. It's good for DevOps kind of stuff. Um, but the two main ways that devs tend to use are either the web browser console or the command line. So quickly, a little bit on application scaling, and then we'll get to the demo. So as you all probably know, we have two types of scaling. We've got vertical scaling, where we just throw more resources at the problem. So this is the big bug in the picture, more CPU, more RAM, whatever it might be. And then we have the horizontal scaling, where we uh, throw many smaller commodity resources at the problem, the, the ants there moving the leaf together. And that's the type of scaling that we've got on OpenShift at the application tier. So as the load ramps up, uh, more instances of your application are spun up to handle that. Uh, so to put it in a picture, it looks something like this. So here we've got an app, uh, in this case a Java app, uh, and it's spun up three different instances. And this has happened automatically. Out of the box, this will just occur based on the number of concurrent connections to your app. Of course, it's all open source, and this is stuff that can be configured. But the default behavior is based on the number of concurrent connections. It'll spin up uh, extra containers for you, and then use HA proxy to load balance between them. And you can still see that they're sharing a database at the back then. And when the load uh, eases, it will then automatically spin down those containers for you. So that's the basic picture of what we're talking about. So enough of the talky talky. Let's uh, have an actual look at it. So hopefully. This has been working. Should see that this has been hit by some load. Take a second. Let's see some things are going up and down. That's probably as the this goes up and down. So if I refresh this, oh, we can see. So we've got two containers serving at the moment and a number that are, I think, on the way down, being idled down again. Uh, and other places that we can see that, this is the web console um, that you get in, uh, for OpenShift. This is the one for openshift.com, but it looks very similar if you're using the open source project. And if I refresh this, we should also see here the number of gears that this is using. Is that big enough? I'll make it a bit bigger. Uh, is five. And the gears are different sizes. It's using five small gears, uh, and it can scale. I've got it set so it can scale to as many gears as I have. So it's got 36 gears it can scale up to to manage that. And then we've also got uh, MongoDB at the back there. And a third way of having a look at that is from the command line. So if we do RHC app show, oops, and ask it to see the gears. Once it does its thing, you can see, so it's wrapping around here. But if you look at just where all the started are, so this is the Mongo gear. And then we've got those five uh, Python instances, which you can see are all hosted on uh, AWS US East. Uh, there are other, there's another region as well that they could potentially be in. Um, so how do we go and actually get something like this uh, running? So I've got a demo here. And this bit I have pre-recorded just so we don't have to wait for the network so much. Uh, so the first step is to get this RHC tool. Uh, so this is just a Ruby gem. So install Ruby, git and SSH, and you're good to go. So if you gem install RHC, you'll get this tool. Then you run RHC setup. 
It'll ask you what server you want to talk to. In this case, I'm just talking to openshift.com. And it will also uh, upload an SSH key for you. It'll make one for you if you don't have one so that you can talk uh, to the broker securely. And then at the end of that, you're good to go to create an app. So to create an app uh, from the command line, oh, sorry, first of all, what are some of the different cartridges you can put in? Uh, here are some of the, the major Red Hat supported one, ones that are available, but there's also uh, a bunch that are just community created. And you can just put in a URL that links to a manifest file for a community created cartridge as well. But you can see some of the things here. You've got other, the languages I mentioned at the start, so Java, Perl, PHP, Ruby, um, JavaScript, with Node. These are all the things that you can do that are Red Hat supported. So to create an app, RHC app create. I've given it a name, Lufu, then just the name of the cartridges that you want. So I'm going to give it Python 2.7 and MongoDB2. And then from code, so I'm actually telling it that to go away and use a particular um, GitHub repository that I've already created as the template for this app. So out of the box, it'll go up and running. And then at the end, oh, this time I've set the gear size to medium. And at the end, dash s. That dash s is what does the auto scaling part. So out of the box, it'll have that behavior of uh, scaling up to meet load based on the number of concurrent connections. So it's going to ask me to, and you can see it already. So it didn't a whole lot of things happen when you do this. The broker goes away, it creates a container for you. It uh, sets up the SSH access for that. Uh, it's created the database and given some credentials. And it's also set up the DNS. So at the end of this command, at the end, you can see there's a URL that you can then go to. There's the SSH uh, URL as well. A Git remote has been created on that gear. And then it's also been cloned down to your local machine. So at the end of that, I can go in. And now I've got the source of my app here. Uh, so this is what I had on GitHub already ready to go. Uh, I'm not going to talk through all the Python stuff, but the key thing here is this .openshift directory. So all of the cartridges have this. Uh, in there, there's a few different things. There's action hooks. This is where you can put scripts to hook into the build lifecycle uh, of your app. So if you want something to happen every time it's deployed or every time before a server starts or whatnot. Uh, there's cron, so you can have cron jobs running on there. And also marker files. So uh, a good example of that would be the hot deploy marker file. So while you're developing, you can deploy new code without the server actually restarting. You having to wait for that. So here's my data. As I said, it was a CSV originally, and I've created um, some GeoJSON from that. So that's what it looks like. And now I'm going to go and make a code change. So the way to deploy new code to the platform is just to make your changes. So here, this is uh, the JavaScript. I'm just going to go, and I'm going to change the icon. So that little blue pin, I'm going to change it to a custom icon that I've prepared earlier and save that change. So now if I do my git status, we'll see that there's one change there. And then a matter, the matter of uh, deploying this to OpenShift is just doing a git add and push. So adding that to my repository, committing it to my repository locally, and then to actually deploy just a standard git push. And that's then going to trigger on OpenShift a rebuild of this, uh, and it'll actually deploy that code into prod for me. So now if I come across to my new copy of the app, we'll see I've got this new icon here. And this is the, the custom icon, which I think is uh, very appropriate. Um, so that's a, yeah, the new copy running with that change code. So if I come back here, what else can I do? Uh, you do RHC help. It'll tell you some of the other commands you've got access to. So things like tailing, things like uh, port forwarding, so you can access the database uh, locally, for example, uh, doing snapshots and thread dumps. Um, we've also got things for managing an app as a team, uh, things so the members and, and team uh, capabilities there. And other things you might want to do, like SCPing files and SSHing. So we can actually SSH in to the app and do some things in there. And um, this is all secured with SE Linux. So here you can connect to Mongo from in there. Also, I could have done it from my local machine. Uh, and you do have write access in particular places. There's a slash data directory where you have write access and also a temp directory where you have write access. So I can go in here and there's my toilets in MongoDB. You can check out those kind of things, if, should you need to. Of course, most of the time, you don't really need to SSH into your app. But if you need to, it's there. And this one, unlike the other copy, 
is not scaled up. So we've just got the two running there. And we could also manually scale this up by setting a, a, a diff different minimum number of gears if we wanted to manually say. So we've got a sale tomorrow, we want to ramp up uh, the number of containers ready to go, we could do that. And that's, I think, all I wanted to show. So I'll come back here. So to kind of uh, summarize, so we've seen a few different things. Uh, we've talked a little bit about spatial and how you can make a mapping up some of the things that you want to consider. And again, come to the workshop this afternoon if you actually want to give that a go. Uh, talked a little bit about cloud and platform as a service and why you might want to use that and also how it can help you with auto scaling. Uh, if you want to do a little bit more reading in this space, uh, here's a bunch of resources for you. Uh, another great database that people like using for spatial stuff is PostGIS, which also has great support on OpenShift. So those who are more seriously into spatial might want to have a look at that. But Mongo is great for just getting started. Uh, I've got this book, and I've got copies with me if anyone wants it. And just my credits. Uh, and if you want these slides, you'll find them at cadets.codemiller.com. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have time for a couple of questions? or? Yes. Yeah, okay. Anyone, anyone have any questions? Yeah, how long does it take um, to spin up new nodes in a, um, in a, in a high um, um, redundancy situation? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know an exact time. It's pretty snappy. I mean, you saw that it spun up, what, four or five of them or something just while I was talking. It's certainly not a very lengthy process. Oh, I'll oh, repeat the question. Sorry. Uh, the question was uh, how long does it take to spin up the new nodes uh, for redundancy. So yeah, I don't know an exact time, but it's pretty snappy. Obviously, it's not instantaneous. So if you're expecting uh, a whole lot of load to come along, you might do that in preparation. Um, but yeah, fairly quick once it notices that you're at that level. And so out of the box, it's concurrent connections when it reaches 90% for a period, that's when it, it spins it up. But uh, the HA proxy daemon can be customized. So you could make that based on some other metric um, that better suited your situation if you so chose. Yes. How, do you, how, does, how, does, how does development fit into that picture too? Is it typically always code and push to a, a test container or would you work with a local environment? Yeah, local environment? Uh, it probably depends a bit about you and how you like to work. But I think the flow that I've seen with companies that are using this anyways, they kind of fit this into their DevOps kind of style flow. So as your dev, you probably still run it locally. Uh, then you might push to a developer, say Jenkins instance, if you're using Jenkins for CI, make sure that passes and then have it pass through different environments, uh, different, well, we have domains on OpenShift, like namespaces as well. Uh, so a lot of people set it up as a pipeline so it goes through, just like your typical environments goes through QA and, uh, and staging and whatnot and then finally into production. So that's what I've seen, but there's certainly no rules around exactly how uh, you need to do that. It's what works for your situation. Does that answer your question? Oh, sorry, I forgot to repeat it, didn't I? <laughs> uh, any other questions? No? OK. Yeah, oh. One more question. <laughs> I'll wait for the microphone this time. <laughs> um, yeah, how susceptible is the service to disasters? Is there like region uh, specific um, lo um, load balancing so that if one region goes down, do other regions respond to requests? Or is it purely performance? Um, so. It's a good question. Oh, sorry, you did get that on tape already? Or? OK. Um, so a few things. So there, there is a region support in the project now uh, where you can do that kind of orchestration. On OpenShift Online, though, it currently only runs on two different regions. So there's Ireland and there's the US. Um, but yeah, in the open source project itself, there's certainly more work around regions and uh, yeah, managing the orchestration of those. And obviously, yeah, you do want nodes in different regions uh, in certain situations in case there is a disaster in one in your infrastructure or whatnot. All right, great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.